And uh, welcome on stage our keynote speaker, MSU. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Ben. Just, Hi, Hi. Hi, folks. Just imagine a crowd of people cheering at the moment. <laughs> yes. Oh, my. <laughs> That is so, <laughs> um, just to give you the full, like, you know, welcome. MSU is a geneticist turned award-winning community manager, originally from Melbourne, now working for PopCap in Seattle. She developed her skills in community management and communications in the indie game scene and further honed in AAA mobile live service. Emma's written for Kotaku and subsequently been featured on sites such as Gizmodo. She's presented at game developer conferences around the world, including this one now. Um, she was featured in MCV Pacific's 30 Under 30 for 2016 2017 and also named as one of their 100 most influential women in games. Emma's here today to open our conference by having an in depth chat with me and with Ben about her experiences and to discuss her thoughts on how community managers and a strong community engagement strategy can help assist game developers to improve the technical aspects of their work. <laughs> Welcome, Emma. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure and it's an honor to, um, you know, Rep a, uh, a homegrown conference as well. I mean, I'm, I might be in the US, but I still have a lot of love for home and being from Melbourne, especially. Yay. Aww. Um, I just want to, just before we kick off, I just want to do a, an acknowledgement. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. So just wanna, wanted to do that. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Cool. So, Emma, we have this chat to kick off, and it's always going to be super awkward because we're like, how do we, how do, we do a com conversation in this, in this format? But um, first off, I guess I kind of want to ask you a bit about community management. I think mm -hmm. everybody who's watching has an idea of what community management is, but I want to know what it means for you, what, what the role is, and um, if you could sort of explain a bit about like, how, how you found it and how you found your way into it. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a bit of an interesting story. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I originally am from the sciences. I, I double majored in genetics and microbiology and did my postgraduate in human medical genetics. And that was all cool in that. Um, and I've sort of been a lifelong gamer. Um, I grew up playing Magic the Gathering. I remember the first thing I learned about computers was .exe was a program and it was to start Space Invaders. So <laughs> <laughs> I have my dad to thank for that. Um, but through all this, uh, even though I enjoyed games, I never really considered it a career option or a career path. Um, but, you know, I still loved it for what it was. Uh, some years ago, a friend of mine was running their own indie game studio and uh, invited me to sort of help check out the game, play it a little bit and whatnot. And it was during this time I was sort of wondering what my next step in science would be, whether I should uh, continue on to medical school, should I um, go for my PhD, should I take up another science position. And so my friend was like, hey, um, why don't you come help me out? So that's kind of where it all started, um, sort of casually playing the game, giving feedback, and that sort of evolved more into a QA role. And from that, um, I, at product launch, I took over all the social media channels myself, um, including doing uh, near daily Q&A dev streams on Twitch. I really had to learn on my feet, um, not having been previously trained in communications. It was very much an experience, both as a skills wise, but also as a gamer looking, looking past the digital curtain, which was pretty cool. Um, but through all of that, it was a very difficult, very challenging time. Um, but uh, it was thanks to the care of a bunch of um, game development friends who saw what I was doing, saw what we were doing and said, you seem to have a knack for this. You, you might want to consider this. <laughs> I was like, who's, who's going to hire me? Like, you know, I've, I'm self-taught in this. Um, but I took the chance and I changed careers. I uh, applied for a position with Electronic Arts in their Melbourne studio Fire Monkeys, and yeah, the rest is kind of history. Uh, it's taken me around the world, and now here I am in Seattle. <laughs> with uh... <That's> exciting, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit strange. <laughs> we have um, we have we have Alicia in the in the chat as well, saying uh, she's also from STEM and going into games design after she found out it could be a career, which is yes. really cool. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. Always love to know about more people who ha have interesting pathways in. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I remember a while ago I was talking talking with some folks, and 
I kind of came to, to the conclusion that there's no such thing as a useless skill in game development. Like we all come to this amazing medium, this amazing science and art form with a bunch of different skills and experiences and perspectives. So I think having that diversity, not just being from a, oh, I did computer science or I did um, 3D animation and graphics and stuff like that, um, really opens it up to being this wonderfully collaborative, artful, joyful sort of discipline. I'm I'm kind of I'm having a laugh to myself here because I met you Emma like a very long time ago and I knew you when you were doing your genetics um, degree and and I was doing a historian like a history degree medieval yeah. history and um, now we're both here on this yeah. stage talking yeah. about tech and games <laughs> which is just so cool to me. But but who knows like what was that was some years ago it's like we wouldn't have expected to end up in this sort of sort of situation I, I suppose it's like Never. you don't know where life will take you and that's yeah. half the joy of it right was there any kind of skills that you learned from the sciences that you think transferred well across because they're quite different yeah um so when you break it down like a lot of problem solving skills being able to form a hypothesis and being mm. able to test for that sort of understanding your methodology. Uh, I mean, the, the crux of the scientific method is just like, all right, we want to understand. So how about we change one variable at a time? Like, this is just hypothetical. Of course. <laughs> one variable at a time and see what happens. I mean, you can apply that sort of critical thinking and those sort of analytical skills to game development as well. Mm. Going, it's like, what happens if I change this parameter? Does it cause a crash or does it do this? <laughs> Uh, non non Euclidean geography. Uh, ge uh, I've just bugged. It. I've just bugged out my terminology, but you get what I mean. Science. Yep. Science. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Does physics go around the win out the window, basically? Um, so a lot of that sort of core fundamental problem solving, um, analytical uh, thinking, um, I found has benefited me, me greatly. Uh, I mean, you've got additional skills. I mean, speaking from a STEM background, if you are good with numbers and stats and you happen to mm. like Excel, I mean, <laughs> that can be quite beneficial in a lot of cases, but it, it's very much applicable to different parts. Like I've, I've seen people from STEM backgrounds go into um, game design. Um, I've also seen people who have been quite good with numbers go into like project management as, as like a good fit for them. So. You know, it, it really is applying um, your experiences, which may feel very intrinsic to you into like what, what work you have in front of you, what, what feels good to you. And that's like, ha, huh, I've got an idea about that. So I think spreadsheet nerds are super underappreciated. Oh, yeah, totally. I, I, I have a lot of respect for people who actually know how to do Excel. I, I don't understand why people don't like Excel. It's, it's the best. It's, it's, <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pause the conversation, which is something that would be totally fine if we were doing this in person, I'm sure, but like we're on stream, keep it coming. Keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like we had, um, we had an interesting conversation before, um, when we were preparing for this one, um, about, um, the history of community management as part of the games industry and like how how community management came to be something that has been seen as like central to to game development and to you know having a successful game out there and i know that you had some really strong thoughts on that which doesn't surprise me at all um, but i really <laughs> like to hear what they are and um also to sort of hear like i guess a bit about what ben has to say too because i know that this isn't a conversation that um i've heard ben's perspective on either mm. but yeah tell us a bit about that so community management is really interesting. Um, there are some opinions, uh, both within the industry and from, you know, people outside the industry. It's like, oh, community management, uh, that's not, it's not really essential. Uh, it's more of a marketing function. Um, what I think people need to understand is community management in some ways is one of the original, uh, roles that has, has come from the games industry. So we're aware that Usenet forums have been around for a very long time, since almost the inception of the internet. We've always felt the need to communicate. It wasn't until the 90s that we really saw the rise of MMORPGs such as Ultima Online that sort of prompted even more sort of community congregation and groups and the need for moderation and the need to sort of set culture, tone, uh, communicate not just within the community but also from developers or publishers and that sort of thing so it really came with the rise of games 
So, I mean, I may be a little bit biased in saying this, but community management and needing to communicate with your community and players is, is really important, particularly as we are now in the age of live service. So constantly needing to do content, but you also want to like hear the feedback and the reception to, you know, updates, content, features, that sort of thing. That's really intrinsic and sort of helps lead to direction of development, I feel. So that's, that's kind of my two cents on it, but <laughs> it's, it's like, we do have to have to nod to history, to some of that early work, that proto community management work of done with moderation, like even, even before the rise of games. So, you know, there's a lot of overlap. But like community management is not just for games. There's a lot of industries out there from fintech to brands to manufacturing um, retail that utilize community managers or social media management. There is an overlap. They're not the same thing there, but there's some overlap. Yeah, for better or for worse, the games industry has some very passionate uh, customers um, and having that connection definitely does help develop a game, develop a product. Um, you definitely see it with brands outside of games as well. People uh, associate themselves with a brand when they feel like they're connected and heard from that brand as well. So making your players feel like they're part of the ecosystem, that they're part of, they're being listened to um, is super, super important. Totally, totally. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and that's one of the, the things that I love about community management and what I do is that even though I, I am sort of self-taught through all the skills, the technical know-how and, and whatnot, what I really enjoyed was actually building genuine human relationships between uh, individuals and also groups on, on scale. I, I found that personally quite fulfilling. Um, that, that's just my story though. People may feel uh, they have a different journey in, in comms or in games at large, but you know, you're totally right. But for me, I felt really motivated to you know build and and consolidate good relationships with, with people in the community um we have a question that's uh in from the chat um alicia's asked how would we properly balance an identity of a game and still cater to the community Ooh, that's a, that's a really interesting one and you can I would sort of think of like, what is your brand voice? What is the product of your voice? What, how are you, how, how do you anticipate communicating with the community and your players? I mean, you do want to stay authentic, but you can have various flavors of brand voices. Like you can, you can have playful, zany, that sort of thing. You can have quite straight laced. Um, I'd also consider what platforms you're intending to communicate on and how what i mean by how is like are you speaking from a brand account like a, a twitter or a facebook or you know a shared brand or publisher account versus hey i'm from the development team um i'm a member of of working on this game um let this is how i speak so there's a, a little bit of, of flexibility but i'd probably say you know have a look at what your brand voice and your brand tenets are and how you want to communicate with that and also then work out you know, how are you communicating through brand or through fan or in platforms where you can afford to be a little more individual, or at least you call out that you are an individual speaking. Um, but I'd say at, at the core of it, be authentic, like do your best to be authentic because people do care about connecting with people. So we've, and I think we've like, you, you mentioned a couple of different platforms like Twitter and Facebook and stuff. What about, um, all right, I'll open a can of worms. What about Reddit? <laughs> <laughs> Reddit, uh, Reddit is a double-edged sword. Like uh, outside of work, I really enjoy, uh, enjoy browsing through Reddit. There's some some real top-notch, uh, you know, subreddits out there. I mean, cats is cats is always always the place for me. <laughs> um, but working with uh, more community or yeah, community-owned channels such as subreddits, it can be a little bit tricky because you're not. To share a personal philosophy of mine, um, Reddit and similar platforms are by the community for the community. So I believe that's a central tenet to respect, or at least that's how I approach um, communications in that way. You don't want to go in there and sort of strong arm your way in going like, oh, I'm going to curate this and moderate that. That, that to me goes against the spirit of community run platforms such as that. I, I, I do think there's a lot of benefit to having people congregate in their own space and create their own, you know, places that they can talk about stuff. 
um and if you make contact like as a as an official representative of course but if you make contact with these moderators or these admins and stuff like that you can really build a, a healthy relationship and sort of leverage some of that for feedback for events that sort of thing so um i do respect the autonomy of of fan run spaces and i i, I would caution anyone who wants to go in there and be like all right we're going to own this we're going to put content up there it's like no work hand in hand with your community how do you go about filtering the noise because i imagine it would be a lot of positive and negative swings both ways and just general chatter that comes your direction I'm how sorry, do you negative comments on the internet i know i've heard it happens it's... but yeah how do you how do you go about sorting that and processing that and uh making that usable data that's a really good question um it goes without saying that to do front-facing communications you need to have emotional resilience you need to have psychological safety and that's something that i feel very strongly about both as an individual and what i can do to action but also you know when you're working for an employer they should be um, ensuring the team's psychological safety and security so unfortunately the internet is the internet you will always have a spectrum of commentary uh, whether it be really positive or really negative and that's just how it is but it's sort of a bit of a learned skill and a learned experience being able to parse the hyperbole from the factual and being able to distill that down into hopefully actionable you know uh, outcomes or things that you can take your team but you as an individual first and foremost you know you got to make sure that you feel empowered and feel safe enough to do the work you do in order to you know deal with the community and sometimes that you will take the highs or the lows so that's both comes with experience and also understanding your limitations and people are very enthusiastic i i am enthusiastic about my work too but sometimes i need to know where my boundaries and my lines are like recognize when you need to step away from the computer not because you're not doing work or not because you're not being productive put that to one side but are you okay to continue doing something for a mm. bit and yeah. i mean ideally you should be having people to back you up in terms of like stepping in to help or at least you know lightening some of that emotional labor um but both as an individual and as employers or companies as a whole, you should be supporting your team members who are facing, you know, frontline work. And whether that be also actual security concerns, like should there be threats of violence and whatnot, unfortunately it is quite, you know, we've, we've probably encountered some sort of threat made, whether in jest or not, but having physical security concerns as well as psychological security. Mm. So yeah i mean you've you've had experience with that right like just dealing with that kind of horrible stuff unfortunately um yeah. yeah i have been i have been doxxed before um it's not pleasant and it's not something that anyone should be going through whether you know you do frontline work or not so i know that you're you're working for like quite a large studio now um and i know that also a lot of the folks who are watching um and who are coming along today are not working at large studios you know they're <laughs> they're indies <laughs> they they you know they work for indie studios or they work for themselves um and don't have the ability to like the time the budget the personnel to like have an entire um like community management team or role even and so you know having to share that between themselves or like do that so given that it can be such an emotionally draining kind of role how do you recommend that indie um indie devs and people just starting out um deal with that so people in those situations are often you know wearing many hats and and my hat goes off to them being able to <laughs> to balance all of that while you know trying to do a lot of things at the same time and sort of like I, I understand not being able to dedicate most of your day to monitoring the forums or monitoring social media and that's very okay I, I think working that into your routine of the day of like maybe i'll check twitter for 15 minutes um in the morning to see what people are saying about you know our game how's that going um doing a little bit of planning maybe later on like i think what might be really helpful is time gating it's such a basic thing to say in prioritization but time gating um how much you can 
spend both on your actual time but also your energy and also your emotional wear it off too like if you're having a frustrating day the last thing you want to do is hop on social media and be told something unpleasant (laughs) so you know uh in in that regard it's like just take it in small small chunks your your goal is not Mm -hmm. primarily do communications i would recommend bringing on a professional in some way to do that later down the track but you know just just pace yourself um have a look and listen but you know don't feel overly committed versus the rest of your tasks to work on your product can i ask about the other side so your interface with the actual team making the product um do you have any tips on how to get this information across to them there you're telling them this thing that we worked on for months the community does not like a b and c like how do you deal with that what tips do you have for talking to your team So I would actually take it one step back, actually. So we live in an era, or at least particularly now, where everything is incredibly data-driven. That's fine, but it's usually uh, quantitative data. Where we need to sort of look at the bigger picture of that, it's good to have data, but we need to also look at qualitative data. And that can mean stuff like sentiment. Uh, sentiment is a little harder to put into numbers because it's so subjective and it's very emotive. Because <laughs> it's not people trying. <laughs> exactly. I mean, go for gold. Um, being able to have a look at, at, at the fuller picture and like, what is the feedback that's coming through? We're seeing numbers, but also what are people actually feeling and thinking towards these changes or this feedback? From there, when approaching qualitative data, you sort of want to you know, be subjective to as much as you can in distilling what the key points are. So someone doesn't like this color for the UI versus (laughs) purple for the UI or something like that. (laughs) It's like, what can you distill it down to, to what could be potentially actionable and understanding, you know, uh, some of the psychology and how people are approaching giving their feedback, um, why are they saying it? Ooh, have we lost her? Uh, you're muted there, Lily, as well. Oh, I <laughs> love this whole thing. Not only is <laughs> this happening with Australian internet, people freezing yep. and all of that kind of thing, but uh, yeah, American internet has it happened too. I feel slightly better about that. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm so sorry about that. That's okay. So, you seem it to be happens. back. You're a bit low. I oh, know you're coming back now. You look good. Yep. All right, cool. <laughs> I keep I keep thinking about that tweet where they said like um, Zoom calls and all these things are like sounds. It's like Elizabeth, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just. Oh! <laughs> Emma, are you there? Oh, no. <laughs> Knock three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's okay. I'm sure we'll get it back. <laughs> oh, these are the these are the perils. Oh, well. oh, oh, oh yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I love that we got to pull out our technical difficulties to <laughs> show you that we made one. Just in case. I'm glad I could facilitate that accidentally. <laughs> it's uh, testing it live. <laughs> Yay. <I'm talking> live. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I, I don't know where I cut out exactly. <laughs> oh, I can't remember either. I got of so all, all that excitement, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, okay, so I got another question for you, um, mm. which was that, um, like, one of the things that you and I have spoken about before is the way that, um, you know, me as a security professional and you as a community manager in games, and I'm, I'm not in games specifically most of the time. Um, I do, like, you know, indescribable corp tech stuff. But that you had Elite some really hacker. useful perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> forgot my hoodie um you had some really useful perspectives as a community manager about security related stuff and how community management helps security and games which i thought was super interesting and part of the reason that i wanted you to be here today. um because i'm biased and i want to talk about security all the time but like can you, can you talk a little bit about that yeah um so being a community manager i'm embedded with the community i i see a lot of conversation go past and you know games being games you know, even when we were kids, come on, like, have we ever, have we not looked up a cheat code at some point in our lives to get past an awfully hard level or to be like, oh, I just wish I could buy everything in the store. <laughs> I still like my, my earliest memories of that, um, which is dating myself, I guess, was um, 
Photon Man in Age of Empires. Basically just, you know, going around blasting everybody else in the game with Photon Man. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My earliest memories of game are of looking up gaming of looking up the cheats. <laughs> See, like that's that's like part and pass and, and that's completely understandable. Um, and the community is going to talk. They're going to want to share information among themselves. And unfortunately, you know, some of this information may come for in a direction that may be exploitative of a, uh, you know, a bug or a, a flaw in, in your build, in your program, or maybe like, hey, I'm able to extract information in a way that I probably shouldn't be able to, like data mining, just to use a very, very broad example. Um, having observed many communities in my time I've worked on a breadth of games over the years uh, you can kind of sort of pick <laughs> little things up here and there for example it's like how did they manage to get that string or what is that asset that sort of thing um, mm. it's it's a little sneaky sneaky I, I appreciate the tenacity but at the same time uh, you know it's a little bit against terms of service generally speaking <laughs> You know, that sort of thing. Um, in, in my sort of experiences, uh, I've been in communities where the people, where, where, where people have not known there's an official presence there. Um, not, not for any nefarious reasons, but, you know, some groups and some communities feel like they're able to speak a little freer when they don't think, you know, a developer or, or something is watching. So you, you sort of can glean information that way. Uh, I, I have previously in years gone past sort of discovered stuff of like, oh, okay, that's, um, that's not meant to be happening in now game. Or, <laughs> uh, that's probably not supposed to be seen. Um, and then escalating that up to my development team to then triage and, you know, uh, have a look at the risk and, and eventually, you know, decide on what course of action to take. It, it can be really interesting. Um, watching these conversations happen um it also says sometimes a little bit of the the microculture that can happen in certain groups and how they approach it i mean at, at the end of the day yes it is out of a love and interest for your product but you should really look at the infrastructure and the security and the integrity of your product as well because the last thing you want in in a case where in live service you're constantly producing content is is to ha have a leaky sieve so to speak so Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also interested in um, how you connect with people, like do, do people come and report bugs to you knowing that you are someone who has that connection to the developing team? Yeah, so I, I've had that happen countless times through the years. Uh, people saying like, hey, I don't know if you know this, but you can replay something over and over again more, more than a limit. And it's, it's really nice that people are able to do that. Yes, it's something that could probably benefit them and the player in, in their experience as a player, and that's that's okay. But for them to reach out to you sort of is, one, appreciative because then we can fix the thing. But secondly, like they respect and they, they feel they can have that relationship that they can approach someone and be like, hey, so this is something happening in your game rather than just like <laughs> scrolling, scrolling away and keeping on the down low. Um, I mean, when you can build those sort of trust and build that sort of bridges and relationships, it's really, really, it's a good feeling. It's a good mm. feeling. Yeah. So yeah, like, is there any other, like, quote unquote, perks of the job to talking to the community? Like you just talked about one thing that was really uh, satisfying and good, but what other things do you really enjoy about talking to, quote unquote, the people? <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the monolith that is the people. Um, actually, so back back in the old pre-pandemic days when we could have in-person events. Um, it when was, was that? Oh, uh, is it still 2020? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's March 2020. Dang. That's <laughs> when it is. Um, back when we were able to have in-person events, uh, have like fan events and stuff like that, it was actually really cool to meet some of these these folks in person. Um, I've actually made some very firm friends over the years, some very good friends uh, from the games I've worked on. 
I, I remember I was in San Francisco uh, GDC in my first year there. Um, there was a lady called Cassandra who I'd befriended some years ago in the community who was also attending GDC and we met up and got to hang out in person and stuff like that, which is lovely. I, I would count having made some of my, my really good friends through games and through interacting with the community. Um, Cassandra, for example, ran her own, well, I believe she still does, runs her own group dedicated to a Sims game, which is really cool. So yeah, there's, there's lots of like awesome. tangible and not tangible uh, sort of perks that I find that I have I've really valued over the years. Um, yeah, you get some really cool experiences out of it. Awesome. I'm just talking of community i was um i mean part of part of why we run this event is because of the community and because particularly the game development community in australia is so lovely and we want to hang out with them um yeah. and we bat above and our just... own weight seriously we're, we're small but mighty <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i'm um i'm really always impressed by all this stuff that everybody keeps coming up with it's just amazing but um I'm just having a look at the chat as well, and um, a lot of people sharing their favorite nostalgic cheat codes, which yeah. is really <laughs> um, I want to go back because, um, you know, part of our conversation earlier, we were talking about community management. We have, um, Sean has asked, how does one get into community management as a uni mm. student and, and succeed in it? Ah. Which I think is a pretty important thing to add in. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, when I've had candidates apply for positions, um, looking at community management roles, I've not always necessarily looked at just the formal qualifications. That's fine. I mean, if you looked at my formal qualifications, you'd be like, oh, she's a scientist. Why is she a community manager? That sort of thing. So um, what can really help and sort of develop skills unofficially, but be really useful when looking at community management is doing moderation work. So do you moderate a subreddit? Do you moderate a discord between friends? You have a, like a special interest discord dedicated to a particular anime, for example, mm. um, that you moderate. Being able to show um, skills where you've been able to do that sort of work. Um, being able to handle sort of like crisis or high stress situations now we're not expecting like the world to end that sort of thing but being able to show that you've you've worked in managing some of that like in communicating and being sort of like a pos a, a force for good um and setting culture and being positive that sort of thing um so those are those are sort of like non-traditional ways you can approach community management i definitely appreciate candidates who have been like yeah I've, I've done my own thing i've helped run run groups uh you know that sort of thing um more formal stuff there is like courses you can take i believe um there are a multitude of providers and various companies that will you know offer certifications or courses on community management for various platforms um i for me personally um i would be willing to take on people and, and nurture them where possible who are really enthusiastic who show a genuine interest in the art and also the science of doing comms um, it's not something that is for everyone so to use a, a science sort of analogy if you're going to do a phd research is very much a lifestyle mm. <laughs> lily you probably have have thoughts about this as well <laughs> research is very much a lifestyle um, and it's not everyone's cup of tea uh, community management can sometimes feel like that but also i would check in with yourself and and how are you feeling psychologically for handling what can feel like a torrent of commentary from across the spectrum Mm -hmm. um yeah because that that really does play into it being able to have that um it's an interesting balance of of having a tough skin yet always being empathetic and always understanding and seeing things from a different point of view because you can i mean with with some work and with some practice uh, you you sort of learn to understand uh, when a community is feeling a certain way and it's like what you can do to help that to avoid it turning into a toxic situation or, or what have you so I, I know I've rambled a little bit I, I hope that <laughs> gives some of my thoughts on the matter um, but yeah if you also just reach out to other community managers reach out to 
some to like uh, if there's a game that you like re- find out who the community manager is and drop a drop them a note see if they've got anything for you as well to offer for advice and perspectives and stuff like that I'd, I'd really recommend it and i'm often flattered when i have people saying hey how do i do your job like how do i do community <laughs> management i'm just like wow it's <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a story we so, are so now do- at a point Sorry, no, go, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, well, what I was going to say is we're now at this point where we're having a lot of questions coming through about a lot of the different aspects of this conversation, which is exciting. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try and cover up as many of them as I can in the time that we have left, if that's okay. Yeah. And then feel free to feel free to tag team yep. with me on this because <laughs> we've got some really good commentary. Anna asked, um, I know developers often camp out on the hacker and exploit community forums. Do community managers also do that? Can, can you comment? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I can't <laughs> speak for everyone. Um, I I am observant. <laughs> I try to be observant and and be aware of what's going on around me in my community. Eyes emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Each one has. Everyone has their own flavor of doing doing things, and that's okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. Um. What other questions do we have? Oh, Jared. Have Jared asks, have you had a translatable skill that you weren't expecting to fit in into your role? From like STEM, from genetics into community management. This is this is entirely nerdy. Um, <laughs> so when I, I worked in science, I was in clinical pathology for a while. So I worked for, uh, you know, I rotated around a couple of hospitals around the, the Melbourne metro area. And you kind of pick up a little bit of lingo, uh, medical lingo and shorthand and that. And for a while, when I first started out in community management, when I was uh, particularly writing about history, I would do shorthand like HX, which is very <laughs> medical. So I've sort of taken on some of that shorthand with me. It's it's probably web, uh, ebbed and flowed over the years, but I uh, I remember that I was, I was writing around, I was... Um, I'm trying to understand a particular uh, issue that was happening, and I'm just like, okay, so what's the history of this? This all started blah, and I started doing HX equals blah blah blah. So that's that's super nerdy. <laughs> super cool though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How how do you talk about nerdy stuff at a games convention? <laughs> Touche. Touche. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just a side note: Will you be sticking around in the chat, answering questions if people have them for the for the rest yes. of the? Good I person. will be hanging around on Discord as well. Um, so if people want to hit me up on Discord, they're more than welcome to. Um, yes. I'm under the community management uh, role assignment, so I, I I has cat for picture. <laughs> We've still got a few minutes left, so if you've got any more questions, please throw them in the chat. Um, but yes, uh, Emma will be around. Which go 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 Excellent. hassle her in the nicest possible way. I'm just having a look at the chat now and seeing um, all the talking about <laughs> other cheats. I would, I never would have gotten out of bed in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy without cheat codes. That game is hard. It was ridiculously hard. The, yeah. You, 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 oh like if you'd spend too long just looking in your bedroom, you die instantly. If you spend, <laughs> yeah, it's as a huge Hitchhiker's Guide fan, I loved and hated that game. It's impossible that game unless you had cheat codes. But it was great. Uh, and Hian was saying, um, I remember being taught Sims 1 cheat codes before I even knew what English was. And not just that, but <laughs> without knowing how to use a keyboard. Which Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's awesome. To me, it's yeah. the Lemmings just... 2 click in all four corners to unlock everything. It's the, it's the one that's engraved <laughs> in my head. Actually, having oh, worked on the Hospital. Sims franchise. Sorry? Oh, sorry. No. I have, having worked on on the sims franchise a little bit um you know i worked on the sims free play and also the sims mobile and also helped out with like the hd sims like sims 4 ish um had a had a colleague on that um every time i hear the sims in my head i just go so so <laughs> <laughs> actually in uh, uh electronic arts uh, headquarters in redwood shores there is a giant plum bob in the foyer like a giant plum bob what's a plum bob oh, wow. It's the little green thing on top of the Oh, heads. yep, yep, yep. <laughs> that's a green thing. Oh, the show me ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. A couple more questions. Um, 
Adrian asks, what sort of resources do you find critical to help with community management workload? Any tips or tricks for solo studios would be, would be welcome. Social media listening suites, to which there is multiple, um, things that can scrape, things that you can set filters for. Um, there are a lot that are up and coming utilizing um, AI and machine learning, which is actually pretty cool. Um, they're easily accessible. Uh, you know, there are, um, there are things that may, may suit your needs and stuff like that. Um, for me, uh, working out of Google Sheets, I know that sounds really benign and, and silly, but working out of Google spreadsheets. Sheets. spreadsheets. We already praise spreadsheets. <laughs> um, and Google Drive being easily accessible and being easily shareable. So if you're working even with a small team, I probably don't need to explain this so you can, everyone can see stuff. Um, but I use Google Sheets for my content scheduling, um, which might not be what other people use, but I use Google Sheets and it served me very well through the years. Mm. Um, Having a scheduler, if you're running multiple uh, social media platforms, like if you're cross-posting to Twitter and Facebook and you know what have you, um, having a look at schedulers are really useful as well. But also you want to make sure your posts are actually going out because you know stuff that ha does happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a mix of working organically, uh, which is like working in Facebook or Twitter or uh, uh, Reddit and stuff like that. Um, but I know a lot of people also choose to use uh, something that might collate everything together. Hmm. And that's cool. Um, and we have one other question from Alicia, which I think is a really nice one, which is, um, I know we've spoken a lot about how um, the emotional workload hmm. of being community manager is um, pretty intense and that it's important to take breaks because this is a tough job. But Alicia wants to know, what is the best experience about being a community manager? Oh, that is really hard. <laughs> oh, that is very, very hard. I enjoy and find rewarding the advocacy part of community management. Mm. Um, like the, the discipline sits right in the middle of being the interface to the community for the developers and also to the developers for the community. So advocacy can go both ways. And I find in my personal experience, it does go both ways. So it can be little wins in terms of someone's come to you saying, Hey, uh, I would like this quality of life change, uh, quality of life change, please. Um, could you please suggest this to the team? And when I have it, it makes it into the game and stuff like that. It's sometimes it's the little wins. Sometimes it can be like, okay, we don't like this thing. Can you please tune it? I'm just like, <laughs> Hey, Hey folks, people are talking about this. So I, I find the advocacy in its spectrum of experiences that I've had really, really kind of rewarding. Um, I also have really found rewarding working with good teams and teams that are supportive. Um, I have had bad, my good days and bad days, but when I've had my bad days, I've had my, my folks around me, my team around me, like, well, we, we're virtual now, but like the virtual hugs, I've, I've had people come up to my desk. It's like, I see you, I feel you. Let me give you a hug and you know, it's stuff like that even though you might be having a rough day that you really really appreciate and, and love the people that you work with and stuff like that awesome i think we should wrap it up we're getting to the end of our time slot but thank you so so much emma for helping us open up yes. the conference and all your insight um please everyone thank emma for her amazing amazing talk and just again imagine the round of standing ovation um <laughs> yet um uh, but thank you, thank you so much for inviting me it's it's been a it's been a fun 